RNZ News at one o'clock, ngā mihi o te rā. Good afternoon. Ko Sarah Bradley tēnei. The Prime Minister is to hold a media conference on the COVID response shortly. We'll cross to the Beehive when that begins. To other news, the Black Caps are feeling relieved after arriving safely in Dubai, having abandoned their tour of Pakistan. New Zealand cricket cancelled the tour on Friday, citing a security threat. Players Association. Chief Heath Mills says their team's arrival in Dubai earlier this morning is a real relief for everyone. Most of the players will return to New Zealand over the next week or so as flights and managed isolation rooms become available. The local Pakistan community believes New Zealand is sending the wrong message with the decision to abandon the tour. Asim Mukhtar from the Pakistan Association of New Zealand believes the security threat has been exaggerated. He says Pakistan has won accolades as a great tourism destination and he fears that reputation could be harmed. Asim Mukhtar hopes the planned England cricket tour will still go ahead. Search teams are discussing their next steps in the search for Thomas Phillips and his three children on the King Country coastline. Mr Phillips from Otorohanga has been missing for more than a week. Ina karangatanga maha o te motu, tina koutou katoa, and happy Women's Suffrage Day um, to everyone. Today I'll update you on how Auckland is tracking with its vaccination rates, and I'll also have an announcement on a significant government investment into COVID research and response. But first I'll hand over to Dr Caroline McElnay to give us the latest case numbers. Namihi Prime Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. There are 24 new cases of COVID-19 in the community to report today, all in the Auckland area. This takes our total number of cases to 1,050. 688 cases have now recovered, including all 17 cases in Wellington, meaning there are now 361 active cases, all in Auckland. There are no new cases of COVID-19 to report in recent returnees in our managed isolation facilities. Of today's 24 new community cases, there is a known connection with 21, all of whom are in isolation. Of those 21, 19 are household contacts. 12 were already in quarantine when they were tested and the other nine were isolating at home. Investigations into the connections of three remaining unlinked cases are continuing. And we just want to note that um, we do expect a number of further cases in the coming days, as some of the new recent cases do come from large households. What we know about Delta is that it's more infectious, so we do expect more household contacts to subsequently test positive, but these contacts are already in isolation. Of yesterday's cases, all 20 have now been linked to existing cases, with 18 being household contacts. There are 13 people in Auckland hospitals today with COVID-19. Of those, four people are in ICU. We do know that this is a stressful time for them and their whanau, and our thoughts are with them. On testing, there were 5,028 swabs taken throughout Auckland yesterday, which is a good result for a Saturday. There are 20 community testing centres available across Auckland today, including six regular community testing centres and 14 pop-up testing centres. If you're a contact or have visited a location of interest at the relevant dates and times, are connected to one of the seven suburbs of interest or have any suburb, any symptoms of COVID-19, even very mild ones, please get a test and isolate at home until you get your results. Just a reminder, our suburbs of interest are Mount Eden, Massey, Mangere, Favana, Papatoetoe, Otara and Manurewa. 
In those suburbs, suburbs there were 1,101 swabs taken yesterday from both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. An also reminder to call Healthline or your GP for advice on getting a test if you have other less common symptoms. Those less common symptoms are symptoms like diarrhea, headache, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, chest pain, abdominal pain. A further 1,142 essential workers were tested yesterday across a wide variety of agencies and businesses, including healthcare workers, transport operators, and some local council workers. This takes to 26,703, the number of essential workers that have had an asymptomatic COVID-19 test since the 1st of September. All test results, very pleasingly so far, have been negative. Yesterday, 13,833 swabs were processed throughout the country. I just want to touch on um, uh, one of the new cases being reported today um, is a new and as yet unlinked case as a man who was remanded into custody at Mount Eden Prison on Friday night. He is understood to have been in the Firth of Thames area before he was taken into custody. This is within the County Manukau DHB area and is under alert level four restrictions. He was traveling with one other person who is now in isolation and is being tested today. Two locations of interest at Mount Albert and Mangri have so far been added to the ministry's website. Four police staff are now isolating following contact with this case. Corrections have advised that as the prison is closed to all visitors, only essential staff were on site. Five corrections staff and six prisoners have been identified as contacts and are isolating. This case, his travelling companion and his contacts have been helpful and cooperative, cooperative with our health authorities. Just an update on the truck driver that we reported on Friday. There are now 140 contacts of the truck driver outside of the household who, um, who were at locations of interest. Of those, 81 people have already returned negative test results. And just a reminder to check our website for um, those locations of interest. On our vaccine rollout update, more than 4,684,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have now been administered. Of these, 3,078,000 people have had their first dose and 1,606,000 people have had their second dose. 430,189 doses have been administered to Māori and 285,296 doses to Pacific people. Yesterday, there were 53,386 doses given nationally. And lastly, on wastewater, ESR have advised us that there was a positive result in wastewater taken from Pukekohe on Wednesday. This follows a positive detection from a sample on the 8th and a negative result on the 10th. These positive detections are likely to relate to known cases in that catchment area. But ESR have added several new sampling sites across Auckland and surrounding areas in order to better target high-risk areas. There are no other new unexpected detections to report. Back to you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Dr McElnay. Just briefly on the newsly advised case that has been detected by correction staff at Mount Eden, I do want to acknowledge the protocols that are extraordinarily rigorous that have led to that detection. Uh, corrections uh, treat in level three and four new incoming prisoners as they would uh, an individual coming in at our border. They are tested at day zero. They continue to have day uh, tests through to day 12. Uh, they wear masks and staff wear PPE, and they work through a process to ensure that someone is COVID-free before they're integrated uh, more fully into the prison environment. Off the back of that testing is how they've detected this new case. Um, whilst we've not formally linked the case yet, there is a tentative link, but more work is being done uh, just to shore uh, that up. But I want to acknowledge both the police staff and the correction staff involved in this case. And if people are wanting a bit more information on the the, the process that corrections use, they have put out a bit more information. I would be happy to expand on that today as well. Overall, you will see from the update today, which also covered off yesterday as well, that despite larger case numbers, they continue to be dominated 
by household contacts. We have had unlinked cases over the course of this week, but we took the opportunity today to re-review some of those cases. Many of them have been subsequently linked over um, the, the days that followed. That does still, however, present some challenges for us. While it means we can join the dots, those dots do still produce more cases with more household contacts. It means that the towel produced by Delta is long and it is um, uh, tough, and people will have seen that in our case numbers. But it doesn't change what we need to do, and that continues to be stay at home and get vaccinated. On that front, since I spoke to you on Thursday, Aucklanders have turned out in force to do the best thing they can do to gain greater freedoms and avoid future lockdowns, and that is get vaccinated. If you'll recall, last Monday I challenged as many of the city's residents as possible to get their first dose, even if that meant bringing a booking forward. Over the last week, Auckland DHBs administered on average 15,375 first doses every day and 8,800 second doses. 78% of eligible Aucklanders have now had their first dose. Just another 30,000 people in the city reaches 80% of first doses. But every unvaccinated person opens up the potential for a new chain of transmission to start, so we need to keep going and get our rates up even higher. The three vaccination buses that launched last week have had a successful start. From tomorrow, an additional two buses will be on the road operated by Māori providers, Manurewa Marae and Tuakina Trust, who have already developed outreach plans based on community feedback. Tomorrow, Huakina Trust will begin running their bus in Pukekohe, and on Tuesday, Manurewa Marae will begin running their service. On Friday, two buses will form the basis of a Pacifica pop-up community vaccination event in Favona, which will be run by Pacifica providers. We'll keep you updated on additional locations for the week as that information comes to hand. If you're not already vaccinated, then there is just one thing to, if there is just one thing to do today. Make sure it's getting your first dose. And if you know someone who hasn't been vaccinated, call or reach out to them today to encourage them to get vaccinated too. Some people will have genuine questions and concerns. And if they do, listen, share information from trusted sources. Often it's just a case of people having the information they need to make a decision. But for some people, they may not have gotten round to it or need help to make a booking or find out where to go. We all have a role to play in supporting others to get our vaccination rates up as high as possible. It is free. There are sites open all across Auckland and the rest of the country, so please get vaccinated to protect your family and loved ones. Today, the government has also confirmed its commitment to research, science and evidence that has underpinned our response to COVID from the start. Since the emergence of the virus, our research community has worked tirelessly to help us contain it and save lives. And it's been this work that's helped us control the virus. But we need to make sure we keep up that work. COVID is not the first challenge of this nature we have faced, and it won't be the last. We need to sure ensure we are in a continual state of preparedness. So the government is announcing today an investment of $36 million over the next three years in an infectious diseases research platform to boost Aotearoa New Zealand's COVID-19 response and preparedness for future pandemics. We've set two general themes for the investment. One, improve the prevention and control of infectious diseases. And two, improve the management of and response to infectious diseases. I'll hand over to Associate Minister of Research, Science and Innovation, Dr Aisha Vera, at the conclusion of the questions today to provide more detail and to take your questions. But for now, we'll open up. Mr Minister, yes, so the 24 new cases today, what does that mean for Auckland um, when, they, when you think about making a decision tomorrow? Is 20 and then 24 does that make it impossible for them to move down a level? With what you will have heard us describe today, of those um, cases today, we've got um, one with a, a tentative link that we're, we're working through, uh, and then another two who are awaiting interviews. Uh, and then yesterday, of course, you will have heard us run through the linkages for those cases. So really what we're seeing is the ongoing ramifications of Delta being highly infectious um, and it infecting people across households, and sometimes in a domino effect. We might have had a positive case um, days and days ago, but then we uh, slowly those family members who have become infected come through as positives. I know that that is 
really anxious making for people when they see those numbers. They don't always tell the full story, but it does tell us Delta's tail is long and it is hard. Dr. McElnay? Mm. No, um, no, that's right. And um, we we will be preparing um, advice um, today. Uh, which looks at the outbreak as a whole. And as I said on Friday, uh, we're still um, cautiously optimistic that actually the vast bulk of this outbreak is under control. We're just dealing with a long tail. Mm. You're so feeling over it, you've done, yeah. you've had enough. How much of that are you taking into account when making the decision? Well, we take into account everything. But the one thing I would say to Auckland is your work has paid off. As you've heard from our public health advisors, they consider um, that this... Uh, outbreak. Uh, we do not have large-scale community transmission in Auckland, and that has been because of Level 4 and the work that people have done. So Level 4 has played an incredibly important role of getting that outbreak under control. Yes, we still have cases popping up. There's still work for us to do, and we'll take all the advice on the best way we can do that from here. But we absolutely factor in how Auckland is a uh, are coping with some of the restrictions that we've had to date, but also the best way for us to get back to normal as quickly as we can. What about the rest of that? the country then with that yeah. three and one? Would you consider doing that? Uh, no, you've, you've already heard us. Last week you will have heard us say that. So long as we're in a level three or four situation in Auckland, it poses risk. Uh, yes, uh, there may be less risk uh, once we're in a three because that's a sign that we believe we've got it, broadly speaking, in a controlled and managed way, but it still presents risk. And you only need to look at some of the stories over the course of the week that despite best efforts, in some cases, people will work very hard to get around controls like testing at the border and border checks. So those extra measures in other parts of the country are not there because we believe we had COVID in those places. It's there in case COVID comes into those places. Yeah. How many uh, mystery cases do we have in total and how comfortable are you with those given this decision tomorrow? Over the last two weeks we've had 12. I think actually if we re reviewed some of those that may actually be less than that because even this week we've knocked quite a few off the list. As of this morning, uh, we had four, that was down to four, but we still are awaiting the interviews from the the three today, yep. one of whom we think is already linked, tends yep. to flink, so yep. the other two. Yep. Okay. So the only difficulty, of course, we are, you'll see that retrospectively we'll get them and within that first 24 to 48 hour cycle, we're often linking them. The issue with retrospectively linking is it's good news in that we can tell where COVID's journey has traveled. And that means we can track backwards and try and put those individuals into isolation. But it does mean it's more likely that COVID has then moved and potentially infected. Whereas, of course, what we like to see is us already having identified contacts and then being in isolation when they test positive rather than the reverse. So it's good to link, but it's even better if you've known them in advance. And just on um, restriction, um, lockdown restriction break, rule breakers, we've seen more of those today. Uh, what's your message to people who are considering or who are trying to do that? Yeah. yeah I would say... Think of everybody, think of the Aucklanders who for the past five weeks have done exactly what has been asked of them and, and at great sacrifice. There have been some really horrific stories of people who have every reason to believe that actually their reason for travelling is a, is a good one, but we're trying to protect everyone. So I would say think of everyone else in Auckland, but think about the people you put at risk by travelling. They don't want you coming into the region at the moment, so sit tight uh, while we work on ensuring that it is safe. On that. Joe, just in terms of the numbers, is um, I guess the, the total number less of a worry and the bigger worry yeah. than the number that you've actually got infectious in the community? Because from my count over the last three days you've had 22. So how difficult is it to actually get down to zero when you're still, I, I understand there's lockdown and yeah. people, but they're still going to supermarkets and, and other essential places. Yeah, even that's a bit more nuanced because for the most part, um, uh, with the exception of when you see an essential worker like a truck driver, then those contacts might be, uh, those locations of interest might be broader. But for the most part, um, you're right to say it's actually just not the total number. It's been the activity of those numbers and how you're able to link them. But for the most part, many of those activities have been pharmacies, have been supermarkets, have been laundromats. Uh, and we haven't tended to see cases spin off from those places, in large part, I'd say, because of the protocols that exist. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why we focus on the household contacts, because the household contacts 
are ones who already um, have had that advice to be in self-isolation or are in a quarantine facility. So that reduces right down the ability to be, for them to be infectious in the community. They'll still be reported as cases, but the risk obviously is, is um, a much, much reduced. And Dr Mekama, you said before in um, one of your responses to suggest that you um, were looking at the broader picture and you were pulling that together today. Can you just give a little bit de more detail about what that is, what it will involve, are you going to release it publicly, what's, what's the deal with it? Well, we're still, um, we're still undertaking that, we're still finalising that today. Um, we do that regularly and provide our advice. We're, I it's provide my advice to the Director General. And you, the you hear General. it. So that advice that Dr McElnay is speaking about is the advice that informs Cabinet decision. And so it goes through Dr Bloomfield and then he provides that advice to um, Cabinet. And when we come down, that is the advice that he's speaking to um, on his side. Work that's looking no, at the no, entire clusters. No, and the, and the, across what's happened um, across the entirety of the outbreak, but in more recent days to inform the decision over um, movement. Do you think though, now that we've been in um, the scouter period for a while now, is there, um, I don't know, like a Brian Roach type group who is actually starting to, I guess, look at the trends and, and kind of map and, and lessons learnt and, and start to look at that data as a bigger picture? Well, I guess there are modellers who um, look at each individual outbreak, and I think the one thing that we're getting through consistently from them is that when you start getting to this part of an outbreak, it becomes a lot more difficult to model um, because of the size. We're dealing with smaller numbers and uh, you almost need to be able to pick up uh, some of the intricacies of the outbreak, including size of households, to really be able to properly model. So look, that work continues on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, we're always looking for improvements and alterations to the way that we're operating. And Brian Roche's group is in a continual improvement and group. Um, but I'm not sure I've completely answered your question, though. If you're asking whether or not there's something specific to this point of the outbreak, that's the public health advice, because that is constantly... The Brian Roach group was billed as a real-time group, so I'm yes. just wondering whether Chris Hipkins is actually getting, has had over the course of the last five weeks, some regular feedback about how this outbreak has been managed, um, response, uh, things that could have been done differently, preparedness, that sort of stuff. Is we, I think it would be fair to say that we, we in real time, undertake that... Uh, real-time assessment, you know, every single morning when we brief. We can't... No. <laughs> no, but I guess if you're looking for real-timing, we're in the middle of it right now. I mean, if you're going to assess something, you need to have a little bit of re ability to cast backwards. We're in, still in the middle of it, is what I'd point out. Um, just, 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 yeah, uh, just um, a couple of questions on Mount Eden case. Yeah. Uh, was he symptomatic when he was taken into custody? Oh yeah. Oh, there has actually there has been some discussion over symptoms, hasn't there? So it must have um, been. I I can't recall yeah. actually. Um, I'm I, sorry. I believe so. I believe so from my from memory. And why did the uh, man make an in-person appearance at the Manukau District Court rather than an AV? I can't. Um, I can't answer that. That would be a decision, obviously, by corrections, um, by corrections and um, and others. Uh, yes. Yes, that person was symptomatic. Prime Minister, right. how, how, how yeah, many yeah. Was there any questions on the correction case? How, yes. how many of the infections have been down to rule breaking? Do you keep that sort of data? Dr. McElnay. <laughs> um, I can't give you a number. We we ask we ask that question of the public health services when they report new cases to us and um, compliance is a, is a very important part of that. Um, I, I can't give you a number, but they 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 usually say that um, uh, compliance has not been an issue. Mm. I asked that, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, look, from my recollection on some of the briefs, where it has occurred, it's tended to be, it's tended to be fam families that some cases may have care between families or so not, you know, not, not strictly speaking, would you consider them always to be rule breaking? Because there is some room around that, but, but it's often been just actually families um, who might exist over more than one household. So is, it, is again this nagging question that we're sort of getting to the end of what lockdown can achieve in terms of driving down case numbers? Like, are we going to be stuck in this, like, 20s, 10s? For Look, one thing I can tell you is that when we assess where we are, we, we look at the role that ongoing restrictions can play and, the, you know, the role of those really heightened ones at four versus... Uh, the role of the ones that we have at three, 
and the additional value add of, at each at, at a different point in the outbreak. So we, we do get into that level of question and we look back at some of the cases we've had, question whether or not four was material to those more recent cases versus three. That's all part of our assessment and part of the thinking that the public health team do for us. So you can get to zero cases, daily cases? Oh, I, I, I believe that, you know, the ability to continue to bring these case numbers down and inevitably get to a point does exist. It's tough though, I will say it's tough. And we've seen that because we've used the toughest measures we have, and despite extraordinary efforts, we do see that tail. So yes, I, I do believe it's possible, but we have to continually weigh up the best place for us to be as we do do that work. Just, just on back. Just back on the Mount uh, Eden uh, Yeah, I will just stand um, around those here and ask questions. Um, if the, the, the Mount Eden case was symptomatic when they were arrested, why were they not isolated immediately and why were they so, allowed to go to the court? Uh, so let me run through exactly what happened with that um, individual. Uh, so they were tested as soon as, the, I don't know whether they were reporting symptoms, so it would be unfair to say that they, as they were arrested, said, by the way, I have a sore throat and a runny nose. I'm not sure that that was, it may have simply emerged as a, across the line of questioning. Um, so according to um, customs, uh, newly arrived prisoners uh, separately from those that have been in custody for longer than 14 days in prison, so they keep those new ones separate. Newly received prisoners wear masks, and our staff also wear PPE masks, gloves, eye protection, and gowns to prevent future um, transmission. They have cleaning protocols for all areas in which they are separating newly received individuals from others. Um, the, this individual arrived at 6.45 p.m. on Friday night, was tested on arrival, which is standard. They're tested on day zero, day five, and day 12. Um, had very limited contact with others. Uh, did have um, someone that they were in a cell with, which they are treating um, in a quarantine as a quarantined individual. Uh, once they tested positive, they moved to a dedicated quarantine area and are being cared for by fully vaccinated staff wearing PPE, including masks, gloves, gowns, and eye protection. Uh, and then those staff have no contact with others, so they form a bubble. Um, AFS uh, uh, worked with corrections on contact tracing, and it may be the case that some of the symptom onsets may have been discovered at that point. I can't answer that for sure. Where they've identified close contacts through the process of putting someone in custody, they've been treated uh, in a similar way and kept secure and will be regularly tested. Um, of those police staff who were in contact with the individual, um, three were fully vaccinated, one partially vaccinated, and you imagine all the protocols there. The, when they were transporting uh, the individual, they were all wearing N95 masks. So as soon as they had detained the individual, an N95 mask um, was applied for everyone uh, for the purpose of transportation. They were tested as soon as they were taken into custody, and were they then taken to court and appeared at court while they were all waiting? Because I don't know tested. when they... Uh, I don't have the dates and times of, of when they appeared. But keep in mind, this wasn't an individual that was tested because there were any concerns. They were tested as part of a routine protocol that corrections apply. Yeah. And just um, yeah. on today's case numbers, mm -hmm. you see there are 24 cases and three of them are unlinked, then there are 21 remaining. The prisoner is amongst those three. Of the three. Yeah. So yeah. you see there are 19 at household contacts. The remaining two, where were they infected? Do you know that information? So, so household contacts and then what they, there was what's called disease contacts. That's right. There was a known connection with the other two. Um, 19 were household contacts. Um, my understanding is one, uh, yes, one was a what, what the public health service referred to as a disease contact, and the other was a was a known close contact. It's just the way you describe people contact. who don't live in someone's house. So people have come to contact in some other way. Yeah. So just on yeah. the Mount Eden prison, yeah. um, have any judges or lawyers had to isolate as a result of? Going to the court. I don't have um, that information in front of me either. Um, if someone could, does someone have the date and time of when they were appeared? Right. So just one other thing on that. Oh, was no, 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 the the oh, do you mean ah, Yes, um, yes, I was actually asking you. <laughs> I was asking all of you. Um, I'll see whether or not all we can do is... You will have seen you've got a very full brief from Corrections um, as to what they've done with the individual. Um, uh, I've got everything up until the point they were brought into the facility. What I can do is just ask for a little bit more information around what may have happened for the purposes of um, uh, his appearance. Yeah. Sorry, the, the prisoner and the cellmate, do you know if they were vaccinated? Uh, I do not have um, that information, but I can tell you more generally around what the prison population is looking like for vaccination rates. Um, 60, overall, 67% of the prison population have received one dose. 
um, I know that uh, roughly um, uh, 481 vaccinated at Mount Eden, or partially or fully, um, and 564 staff at Mount Eden. So um, because uh, we've got individuals in a residential environment, they are high risk individuals. So they have been part of the planned vaccine rollout. You can see there's a big focus on staff and the reason for the focus on staff obviously is because they present um, a, a risk for bringing COVID into a facility. Uh, so that's why at level three and four, they test everyone coming in, staff have been a focus on vaccine while Auckland inmates have been part of the first amongst inmates to be vaccinated. So we're, we're Just, in Thames, we're in the first of Thames has the person been, and is it possible that they could be connected to that case right at the start of the outbreak that was kind of linked to the Thames Coromandel no, area? No, 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 not at all. From what, from what the, where this individual has been tentatively um, linked is not linked to that in any way, um, tentatively linked. Uh, my understanding is that it's all within the level four boundaries, so this individual hasn't crossed into outside into an area that um, has lesser restrictions. Um, my understanding is that in that area it was more a household context. Mm, that's so. right, and uh, uh, the ARFS and Kindness Manukau District Health Board are following up with the household and the contacts there, arranging testing of the household. We have, we have, a, we have a very good understanding of where this individual has been. Have we, any, have we seen any transmission inside supermarkets or pharmacies, or are they primarily households here in Port? Some people in Auckland are afraid to go to supermarkets. Yeah. Um, Dr. McElnay, no, I don't believe we have. No, during the alert level four, we haven't seen um, any cases, secondary cases, that have developed because um, a person was at a, a supermarket. Um, we have seen, in some of our workplaces, we have seen staff who've become positive. I'm not aware that that's actually happened in a, su in a supermarket, um, but under the alert level four uh, rules, supermarkets we consider to be very, very safe places. And um, we put out the, uh, um, the, the fact that the supermarket as a location of interest, but we, our advice um, has been uh, in alert level four that people should just um, watch for symptoms and get tested. Looking at those border breaches, is Auckland's border controls, are they, are they failing? No. Uh, look, ultimately, we've always said, though, for those border controls, uh, we put in place the expectations. People do have to, for essential work, hold uh, an, a pass issued by MB to travel. They're on a seven-day testing um, cycle. And we do have some other exceptions that apply to individuals to allow them to pass. Um, however, um, people, uh, in some cases, uh, are not telling the truth. Um, in some cases, uh, um, using um, dishonest methods to be able to get through, um, or in some cases, uh, using what are legitimate purposes to then go and undertake um, activities that are not in keeping with the rules. But the reason that we have the rest of the country currently in a level two environment is as a layer of protection for some of those things occurring. Uh, we do everything we can to make sure that we have measures in place but we also know we are dealing with human behaviour. There will be individuals who seek to break the rules and the best third backstop measure is for us still to have restrictions in the rest of the country, just in case. Black hats, they've now. Oh, sorry, Cal, come to you now. Um, just on those 60 or so people who are yet to test negative who are contacts of that truck driver, what regions are they in and will that factor in next week whether those regions will get those additional freedoms under level two? So I'll come to Caroline. Um, I don't have the, the details to hand, but those will have been people who were at the locations of interest that were posted for the truck driver. And from recall, they, there were a couple of those in Mount Monganui and a, a couple in the Waikato. And those individuals will have contacted Healthline and then will, will be on our system. Uh, so we would expect that um, the rest of them um, who have been asked to get tested will get tested and will get those results through in the next few days. On the black caps, yes. now that they've left and flown out, what kind of threat was made against them and who did it come from? Uh, so you will have seen that we've already made statements uh, around uh, the, the threats that uh, affected the game for um, Pakistan and the New Zealand cricket team. And the way that we've described them as, uh, has been as credible and also direct and targeted. Um, there, there isn't much more that I can say beyond that, uh, although we really do support the decision that was ultimately made by uh, New Zealand Cricket to bring the team home. When, in, in terms of the process and how that happened, when were you alerted to that? Did you let them know? 
or did they let you? It know? was a matter of uh, New Zealand and New Zealand agencies letting know, uh, letting the New Zealand cricket team know about the information um, that. Uh, that we had in our possession, as soon as, um, essentially, as as soon as that was uh, cited, that information was sh shared with New Zealand Cricket. How would that work with MIQ as well? Yes. So, uh, work has been done at the moment to try and accommodate, because obviously there's some different, um, their movement back into the country is sooner than was expected. Um, I understand that a, um, a large portion of those cricket members will be coming back um, from, uh, from their midpoint. Um, they're in, at the moment on, on their way home uh, and the majority of them, but not all of them, are able to be accommodated immediately and MIQ are working closely with New Zealand Cricket to find additional capacity. Keep in mind, we, we often operate with some capacity for emergency situations, not large amounts, uh, and so that's what we're working through in order to try and accommodate this immediate need. So they will go into that, those emergency spots? Uh, they are being accommodated, whether or not it's through some of the emergency contingency that we have, um, and we keep that available in case for any reason we need to close down another facility or so on. So we are finding ways to accommodate them. Not all of them, however, at once, because obviously we, we don't always have capacity for that. Did our Just five eyes, is this on the cricket, cricket. Yeah, did our Five Eyes partners tip us off to that threat? Uh, you'll understand why uh, we are not in a position to give further information as to the nature of the intelligence, other than to say it was a direct threat and it was a credible threat. They made the right decision. Prime Minister. So, did you, so um, New Zealand government got this information on what, Friday, and then let New Zealand cricket know? Uh, yes, that's to the best of my recollection, the timeline. And uh, just more generally, I mean, New Zealand cricket team flying into Pakistan, it's running still to Afghanistan, both uh, ISIS, Taliban are active there. Um, it's on the extreme risk list. I mean, what do you think more generally of the original decision that was made to travel there before this explicit mm. threat? So, uh, as, uh, as I understand it, as a matter of course for a situation like this, we will provide information uh, to um, uh, a departing um, organisation, uh, threat assessment if you like, in order for them to make a decision as to what uh, their next steps or whether or not they undertake uh, a visit or a tour. And so that happened in this case, but as I say, that's, that's relatively routine. It's then up to them to make a decision. Yeah, but, I mean, what do you make of the decision given that they're going to the country next door uh, to Afghanistan, we've been trying to get people out of there, uh, and they're going in for a tour and it's a pretty unstable country. Yeah, the look, I mean, what, what's your view of the original look at, decision? Ultimately, look, it was their decision. Uh, subsequently, additional information came to light. Uh, and I believe that they uh, made exactly the right decision in acting on that information when they did. Prime Minister, it was, um, it was good to see Winston Peters pop up on the TV today, looking well and double vaccinated. Do you agree with him that New Zealand not being involved in AUKUS was likely down to, quote, sending the wrong signals after the election, and he cites reduced defence spending and the new foreign minister's direction? No, unless he considers those signals to be legislation we've had since the mid-1980s, uh, I think that's probably one of the strongest signals uh, to those who were uh, deliberating on this arrangement. New Zealand has a very firm, long-standing principle uh, of not allowing into our internal waters or indeed supporting uh, vessels that are indeed fully or partially powered by nuclear power or hold nuclear weapons. So that's the signal and it's been a long-standing one. Uh, second to that, I would say that our other really important principle has been independent foreign policy and I stand by that also. Have you, have you sought like, those assurances from, from the US and the UK that it is purely a nuclear power issue and not about some deepening relationship that New Zealand's not a part of? Look, the engagement that we have on an ongoing basis with the United States, with the UK, with Australia, uh, mean that I don't feel the need to gain those assurances. Our relationships uh, over the years have deepened, they are close. We, as I've said, have been working hard to draw the UK and the United States, particularly into some of the economic architecture of the region. Uh, and so I feel no need to seek those assurances because I believe that our relationships are strong uh, and we already have formalised relationships with each. Finally, when did you last speak to Winston? Do you have an ongoing relationship? Oh, it has been, it has been a little while. I have since the uh, election, but it has been a, a little while. Is there a problem if he pops up and criticises the COVID response or you no. know, foreign policy? or No. 
No, he, he did those things from time to time when he was in government, so I don't see that as necessarily being different. Just, no, just, okay. Okay. Uh, just pop down the back again, yeah. Thank you. Just on MIQ more generally, can you guarantee that all of the 3,000 rooms will be used and none will be left empty? And are you able to sort of talk a little bit about of any uh, future plans that the government has for allowing New Zealanders to travel overseas for business? So we have always run a system that has meant that we have used, of course, the vast majority of our rooms. But you can see from this most recent outbreak why it's important that we still have some availability for emergency situations. We have the whole purpose of MIQ is to keep New Zealanders safe from COVID and that does mean be able to house people from within New Zealand when we have an outbreak, as well as making sure that we deal appropriately with those coming across the border. Do we have a question? Oh, just uh, what are some of the government's sort of long-term um, plans for allowing people to travel back yeah. and forth for business? You will have seen from the Reconnecting New Zealand work that was only announced um, some weeks before this outbreak that we are looking up to vary the way that we use our controls at the border based on risk. Uh, one of the things we are still working on this year is a self-isolation pilot. So essentially taking quarantine into a very tightly managed and controlled environment at home, using technology to support that isolation pilot, and seeing whether we can work up in a vaccinated environment some alternative tools that can help reduce the bottlenecks at our border. Can I just clarify, uh, yeah. with the prisoner, you said that they had come, come from Thames, that's correct? No, I didn't say oh. Thames. In the first... Firth of Thames. Firth of Thames, I think, was the description. But that's level two still, right? Yeah, so I'm just seeking some clarity because this morning on the call I was advised that he had not gone into a level four area. So let me just seek some further clarity on that. What I can say, though, is as I've described to you, we have a very, very good understanding and knowledge of where they have travelled um, based on their past engagement with the justice system. There's GPS tracking involved here. But, but just, just for that, how, how can that make sense if, it, if they've come from an area that wasn't... So the reason what come. you're trying to identify is whether or not this individual posed any risk to others. My understanding outside a Level 4 area, my understanding is the area that he travelled to is an area that he was uh, able to and allowed to be in. He was essentially um, on parole. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I, Jessica, sorry. I don't, I, some of this I may be able to clarify with you with written statements from okay. the police and, and from um, corrections. Just but again, what well, I think is really important is our understanding. Just, just do you have an update on uh, getting the Dickerson family from South Africa over here and MIQ spots and what's being done? Some, to so we have been again working very closely uh, with those with a wider extended family and support to ensure that we have. Uh, MIQ space available for that individual. As you can as you can imagine why, I think it's incredibly important and I know all New Zealanders would agree, getting family support in as quickly as possible is key and we are working very hard to provide it and I understand spaces have already been provided. I'm wondering whether your family had any problems while they were in MIQ and it's not something I've been advised of. And nor necessarily do I think that's information that we would be likely to divulge. I think this is really uh, you know, incredibly difficult. I cannot imagine what this, what this wider family is going through. So that information I see as being theirs. Yeah, I'll look up. Okay, last couple of questions. Here I have Dr. Viral come up. Jari, and then I'll finish the book. Um, apologies if this has already been asked. Tell me if it has. Um, the interview that Andrew Little did yesterday, um, in it he said, the idea of a level four lockdown, I think once we get through this one, I'd be surprised if we ever see a level four lockdown again. Level three becomes problematic too. Um, what do you make of that comment? I mean, we're not near vaccination in terms of being able to... Um, I, guess I don't see that as being at all um, inconsistent with what we've been saying all the way through, which is the best thing we can do to try and avoid lockdowns in the future and those kinds of stay-at-home measures is by ensuring that we have as many people as possible vaccinated. But that relying on not having a breach at the border for the rest of this year, because presumably if at some point this year... You're making the assumption that the only people who want to be vaccinated are Aucklanders. We want everyone to be vaccinated. No, I know, but I'm just saying that for him to say that this one that we're in now is the last one is implying that, and if we're waiting to... If it's going to take until pretty much the end of the year to hopefully get to that vaccinated figure that we want, isn't it suggesting that there isn't going to be a need for a lockdown if we were to have another Delta outbreak this year? I think that what he's pointing to is that we are, on, we are now on the trajectory to reach very high rates of vaccination. He's anticipating that within this outbreak we'll see those levels lift, and once we're reaching those high levels, that in the future from that point, um, we would be seeking to avoid that in the future. You'd use level four again if we had something like this happen? No, no, I'm not saying that. I think 
I think um, probably what you're underestimating is our ability to get through a high vaccination rate in the next in the coming weeks. I mean, next week we should have 80 percent first dose for Aucklanders. What we want to see is that we go higher still. But you can see how rapidly we are moving up through those vaccination rates. We just need to keep that momentum up and support those communities who may have issues with access. Um, who may not have, for whatever reasons, um, uh, reached the decision to be vaccinated. That is the area we have to work hard on over the coming weeks and months. Just lastly, I understand that, but it doesn't, it, don't you require a lot of people to be double vaxxed in order to not need to use a level three or four star lockdown? I think we're probably talking past each other a bit, Joe. Um, what I'm saying, of course, we are using level three and four now because we don't have vac high vaccination rates. Um, you'll see that we're being very cautious about the decisions we're making in that environment. But all, uh, all Minister Little is saying in the future is what I've said. We want to avoid in the future using those levels and the best way to do that is high vaccination rates. Um, just back to the cricket, can you describe for us the nature of your conversation with Imran Khan on Friday? Um, we spoke, we spoke um, twice actually, um, mostly due to uh, just connection issues. Um, pretty brief conversations. I've met um, Prime Minister Khan before um, at the last time I attended the UN General Assembly. We had a, um, a very good bilateral. Uh, and the nature of the conversation was essentially um, he was concerned by the reports that we'd had, wanted to understand those um, and the nature of our concerns. Um, I conveyed um, uh, what I've conveyed to you. Um, and then said, thanked him for the support that the New Zealand team had had up until that point and continued to have, and just our disappointment. We know how important the game was for them and for us, and we all would have liked a scenario where it could have continued. You ask you to intercede to try and get a scenario? No, it was more, more really just wanting to come to an understanding of, of how the decision had been made, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, look, we're going to move over now so that Dr. McElnay can take the stand. Um, I'll get those interested a little bit more information of what we know of the movements of the prison, but again, as I reiterate at this point, there's nothing that has led us to be concerned about contact in a level two environment. Okay. Kia ora tato. Thank you, Prime Minister. I want to thank New Zealand's research community for their valuable contribution to the COVID-19 response. Scientists have helped us save lives through contributions that span across epidemiology, modelling, genomics, diagnostics, infection control, and much more. When the pandemic hit, scientists either volunteered time to support the COVID-19 response or received ad hoc grants for small pieces of research. In order to sustain the contribution of cutting-edge science to the pandemic response and ensure our readiness for future and other infectious diseases, we are investing $36 million in a new research platform. As a former infectious diseases doctor and researcher, I know the lack of a dedicated infectious diseases research fund has been a long-standing gap in our domestic science capabilities. This new fund will focus on areas such as better understanding of disease transmission, further vaccine research, diagnostics, surveillance and therapeutics. I want to encourage researchers to collaborate and make connections in ways that mean the research will have maximum impact. This includes connections with health agencies so research can inform policies and clinical practice. It's also crucial researchers work with Māori and Pacific communities to understand what's most important to them and deliver research that will improve the lives of people in these communities. It's important that we develop public health interventions that are appropriate for our community Otherwise, the inequities that characterise this pandemic will happen again in the next one. The Infectious Diseases Research Platform will be funded through the Strategic Science Investment Fund and managed by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. The SSIF, or SIF, funds investment in research programmes which have a long-term benefit to New Zealand's health, economy, environment and society. First, MB will select a host organisation through a contestable process. The host will coordinate work with the Research Centre, MB, the Ministry of Health and representatives of Māori and Pacific communities to develop large-scale, integrated and a collaborative programme of research, what we call a research platform. We expect the platform will take a best team approach where the best researchers in New Zealand for a given area are included, regardless of their institutional affiliation. The platform will focus the development of our next generation of pandemic scientists, funding which is reviewed annually, will be contingent on performance against this objective. Information can be found on the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment's website. 
We expect to start funding research early to mid next year. Thank you. Minister, will this um, funding and research help speed up work to create our own vaccine? We've already invested in um, uh, local vaccine development capacity to some extent, and um, I think if we were to uh, further fund that, that would be separate. Uh, that's for vaccine development. However, uh, an infectious diseases platform like this will have have some component of vaccinology um, necessarily, but it won't be uh, it won't be developing a vaccine per se. How long is that fund going to last for the thirty six million? It's a three year fund. Is that sufficient in terms of given you know, how much uh, this has cost us so far for a pandemic? Is thirty six million going to go far? Yeah, I think it's really important that we provide this funding now to get research let researchers get underway. And particularly for the new researchers we want to see come through for them to have the opportunity to start their research career working in this pandemic. We'll need to make decisions about future funding when the time comes. What specific countries are you talking about at the moment in terms of sharing research with one another, perhaps through this fund? Well, uh, the uh, scientists involved in, in this fund will be some of the um, uh, best infectious diseases scientists in New Zealand, and through them we will be able to have international um, collaborations, uh, but the fund is for spending in New Zealand. Minister, can I just ask with your sort of knowledge of how the virus works with that hat on, um, just what I took from the Prime Minister before in terms of what would be required if we had another outbreak in the next few months, is that because you might have, say, 80% of the population who has had one dose, therefore you would not require needing to use level four or level three restrictions, which seems like a little bit crazy to me because I would have thought you would need most of the population to be double vaxxed to not need that level of restrictions. So in, in terms of that, what, what would your advice be if there was to be another outbreak in, say, six, eight weeks' time? Would you still need that level four lockdown style to deal with that? I think if we're looking at a six to eight week horizon, I think there is an awful lot of difference we can make in that time to the protection we have against large outbreaks. Uh, we, would, we are approaching, we are past 70% uh, vaccinated, approaching 80% in Auckland very soon. We are starting to get up to the levels where we have far more options, so we just need to keep going uh, with the vaccination rate it, as it is. That high number at the moment is for uh, one dose or being booked to have a dose. It, it's, it's, it's the barn. Does the barn need to be two doses, I guess is what I'm asking. Indeed, two doses and a few weeks past two doses gives the best protection. And you'll recall, But you'll recall that what we, um, uh, the modelling that we've discussed previously from Te Puna Matatini says that there isn't a threshold at which we get a markedly better public health outcomes. But as you start to get higher levels of vaccination coverage, outbreaks become uh, smaller and less frequent. So we're, we're rapidly approaching those sorts of levels, but we just need to keep going. Just on those um, vaccination rates, the seven-day rolling average has dropped um, recently. Is that a supply or is that a demand issue? We have plenty of supply. I think we do need to make sure, and, and we are, that we're um, uh, encouraging everyone who isn't yet vaccinated to come forward, and you've seen that we're continuing to do that there's six different ways most people can get vaccinated within their, their community. So we're really pushing for people to come forward now. There is plenty of capacity and plenty of stocks to get vaccinated. While we're thinking about new things to fight COVID and infectious disease, should, should New Zealand have a CDC, do you think, and then a new sort of health reform? Should that be part of it? I really hope the fund we've announced today will build linkages between scientists and our public uh, health institutions. As part of the health reforms, uh, we'll be uh, developing a public health agency within the Ministry of Health, which will be a place where uh, our public health officials who are well versed in COVID and many other infectious diseases will also be um, able to benefit from strength and technical uh, expertise that we will be growing through through this research investment. This may, I mean, sorry, Dr. Nakona, you're still here, but this may be a better question for you. <coughs> Taranaki's vaccination rates are the lowest in the country. What are we doing to bring those up? 
Uh, I know that um, Minister Little had a meeting with Taranaki Iwi, I think on Friday, in order to make sure that we had identified any concerns that they had and how we could better work with, with them. And we are in constant contact with the District Health Board about how that rollout is going. Does it worry you it's been this long? I mean, Minister Hipkins and uh, Dr Bloomfield have literally been talking for months about how woeful Taranaki is and they're still woeful. Yeah, we need to make sure that we're achieving high vaccination rates across the country. You would have heard the Prime Minister say that many times, that it is not just enough to have a national average, but to protect individual localities from outbreaks, we do need to reach a high level, and we're focusing on those. Uh, we are having conversations with those areas where the, uh, the levels aren't as high as they are elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much.